movable partial dentures and partially edentulous arches simplifies communication and discussions. Many systems of classification have been suggested. In this presentation, we shall discuss the most general and widely accepted system of classifying RPDs and partially edentulous arches, that is Kennedy's classification, and we shall also take a look at Applegate's additions and Fissett's additions to that. So what is removable prosthodontics? It is the branch of prosthodontics concerned with the replacement of teeth and contiguous structures for edentulous or partially edentulous patients by artificial substitutes that are readily removable from the mouth by the patient. It includes two disciplines, removable complete denture prosthodontics and removable partial denture prosthodontics. RPT may be extracoronal or intracoronal depending on what type of retention it is used to keep it in the mouth. The edentulous area can be either a bounded edentulous area which has an abutment tooth on each end or it could be a free end edentulous area also termed as distal extension edentulous area which has an abutment tooth on one side only. Requirements of a classification a classification must satisfy the following norms. It should permit immediate visualization of the type of partially edentulous arch that is being considered. These are few images of partially edentulous arches. So in order to communicate which teeth are missing, we need a classification that suits these edentulous spaces. It should permit Immediate differentiation between the tooth supported and the tooth and tissue supported removable partial denture. So tooth supported RPT is a partial denture that receives support from the natural teeth at each end of the edentulous space or spaces. Whereas tooth tissue supported RPT in that the denture base extends anteriorly or posteriorly and it is supported by teeth at one end and tissue on the other end. So like we saw in the previous image, it is termed as a distal extension partial denture. And of course, the classification should be universally acceptable. Kennedy's classification. It was introduced by Dr. Edward Kennedy in 1925 and it is the most widely used method of classification. It is based on the relationship of edentulous spaces to the abutment teeth in an anterior posterior reference. It attempts to classify the partially edentulous arch in a manner that suggests certain principles of design for a given situation. Kennedy divided all partially edentulous arches into four basic classes. Edentulous areas other than those that determined the basic classes were designated as modification spaces. So the four classes are class 1, bilateral edentulous area located posterior to natural teeth. That is, there are two edentulous spaces located in the posterior region without any teeth posterior to it. So as we saw in the first image, it is a free end edentulous area bilaterally. According to Stratton, the incidence of class 1 Partially dentate arch in the maxilla is about 20% and in mandible it was reported to be about 50%. Class 1 is the most common type of partially edentulous arch seen in clinical practice. Class 2 refers to unilateral edentulous area located posterior to the remaining natural teeth that is there is a single edentulous area which is located in the posterior region without any teeth posterior to it. So the difference between class 2 and class 1 is that class 2 is unilateral whereas class 1 is bilateral but both are distal free end edentulous spaces. According to Stratton, the incidence of class 2 in maxilla was reported to be about 30% and in mandible 25%. Class 3 is a unilateral edentulous area with natural teeth anterior and posterior to it. So in this case, there is a single edentulous area which does not cross the midline of the arch and the teeth are present in both sides that is anterior and posterior to it.
According to Stratton, the incidence in maxilla was reported to about 40% and in mandible 25%. Class 4 represents a single bilateral edentulous area which is located anterior to the remaining natural teeth. So this is a single edentulous area which crosses the midline of the arch with remaining teeth present only posterior to it. It is the least common variety. The incidence in the maxilla according to Stratton is 5% and in mandible 2%. A point to be remembered in relation to class 4 is that class 4 does not have any modifications. Alright, now moving on to Applegate's modification. It was proposed by Dr. O. C. Applegate in 1960. It represents the capability of the abutment teeth to be suitable enough for supporting the RPD. So based on the condition of the abutment, Applegate included two additional groups. Class 5, which is an edentulous area bounded anteriorly and posteriorly by natural teeth. So that will be a class 3, but in which the anterior abutment is not suitable for support. So if we consider here in this image, the abutment teeth are the laterals. Now the laterals are not suitable enough for supporting all the teeth. So in that case, this is basically a class 3 situation, but the anterior abutment cannot be used for any support. So it cannot be treated like a conventional class 3 edentulous space. Class 6 is an edentulous area in which the teeth adjacent to the space are capable of total support of the required prosthesis. So this denture hardly requires any tissue support. Most of the removable partial dentures are tooth tissue supported. Hence this condition is classified as a separate group. Class 6 is the most frequently presented case in clinical practice whereas class 5 is quite rare. Moving on to the rules for classification. Applegate and Swenson and Terkla have suggested rules to apply to the Kennedy classification system in order to eliminate some uncertainties and to make the classification more descriptive. So the first one is rule number one. Classification should follow rather than precede extraction that might alter the original classification. In this case, you can see the molars are missing. So in this case, this would be a class 3 wherein teeth are present anterior and posterior to it. But if we need to extract the third molars as well, then in that case it becomes a class 2. So you see that with the extraction of the third molar, the classification changes. So in this case, if the third molar had to be extracted, that has to be done before we plan the RPT. Rule number 2. If the third molar is missing and not to be replaced, then it is not considered in the classification. So it will be class 1 if we are replacing the third molars. Whereas if we are not replacing the third molars, then it will just be a class 3 wherein teeth are present anterior and posterior to it. You can see how including the third molars in the classification if you want to replace it or to omit it if you don't want to replace it makes a change in the classification. But coming to rule number three, if the third molar is present and it is to be used as an abutment, then it is considered in the classification. So if the third molars are missing and you're not replacing it, you won't consider it in the classification because it will change the classification in that case. But if the third molar is present and it is to be used as an abutment, then in that case, it has to be considered in the classification. Similarly, for second molars, the rule number four says that if the second molar is missing and it is not to be replaced, it is not considered in the classification. So as for third molars, if third molars are not present and you're not replacing them, you don't need to consider in the classification. Whereas similarly for second molars, if they're missing, you are not going to replace it, don't consider it in the classification. Coming to rule number five, the most posterior edentulous area or areas always determine the classification. So it all comes down to this main point. So if there are multiple edentulous spaces, 
it will be the most posterior region which will determine which classification it is and the rest of the edentular spaces will add up as a modification. Rule number six, edentulous areas other than those which determine the classification are referred to as modification spaces and are designated by their number. So the most posterior edentulous space will be the classification. The rest of the edentulous spaces will be added as modifications depending on their number. Rule number seven, the extent of the modification is not considered only the number of additional edentulous areas. That is the number of teeth missing in the modification spaces is not considered. Only the number of additional edentulous spaces are considered. In these three edentulous spaces, the posterior most determines the classification. The rest two just add up as modification two, irrespective of how many number of teeth are absent. And rule number eight, there can be no modification areas in class four because any additional edentulous space will definitely be posterior to it and will determine the classification. So these are the eight rules as given by Applegate for Kennedy's classification. Next moving on to Fissett's additions. It was given by Dr. Jacques Fissett. Class 7 is a partially edentulous situation in which all remaining natural teeth are located on one side of the arch or of the median line. Here you can see all the teeth are missing on one side of the arch whereas on the other side there are a couple of edentulous spaces. It is a very rare case which is usually seen in case of hemimaxillectomy and hemimandibulectomy patients. Class 8 is a partially edentulous situation in which all remaining natural teeth are located in one anterior corner of the arch. So in this image you can see all the teeth on one side of the arch are missing and on the other side all the posterior teeth are missing except for one premolar and two anterior teeth are present. So all the teeth are present only at one corner of the arch. Its incidence is quite rare. It is usually seen in maxillofacial surgery or trauma patients or in case of patients with advanced periodontitis. Class 9 is a partially edentulous situation in which functional and cosmetic requirements or the magnitude of the inter-occlusal inter distance require the use of a telescoped prosthesis, either partial or complete. The remaining teeth are capable of total or partial support for the prosthesis. So in this image you can see there are many edentulous spaces scattered throughout the arch. In this case the appliance needs to be telescoped because it is quite difficult to obtain an appliance with a single path of insertion. Its incidence is quite rare. It is usually seen in patients with partial anodontia and prognathic patients. And class 10, which is a partially edentulous situation in which the remaining teeth are incapable of providing any support. So if the teeth are kept to, to maintain alveolus integrity, then the arch must be restored with an overdenture, which is a complete denture supported primarily by the denture foundation area. So just few teeth are present but they need to be retained but they might be in a poor parental health so they are incapable of providing any support. So in these cases we will prepare an overdenture. It is quite frequently seen in clinical practice. So this was Kennedy Applegate Fissett's classification. Note that the extent of the edentulous space has no bearing in the classification. The location and number of edentulous areas determine the classification. So let's take a look at some examples. So let's just recapitulate what we have read and take a look at some examples. So in this image you can see the anterior teeth are missing right from first premolar to lateral incisor. What class this would be? So this is an edentulous space in the anterior region and all the teeth are present posterior to it. So this will be automatically class 4. In this image there are three edentulous spaces. So applying the applicate rule, rule number 5, the posterior most edentulous space will determine the classification. So here this space will determine the classification. So it will be class 2 and these two remaining edentulous spaces will be added at modification. So this will be class 2 modification 2. Two number of edentulous spaces, so modification 2. 
in this image there are two edentulous spaces in the posterior region so this will be class one we also have one more edentulous space will be which will be added as modification one so this will be class one modification one in the next image there are four edentulous spaces posterior most determines the classification there are teeth present anterior and posterior to this edentulous space so this will be class three three other edentulous spaces are also present so modification three the classification is class three modification three so in this image there are two edentulous spaces so one of the edentulous space determines the classification it becomes class three and the other one is added as modification so this will be class three modification one this image the edentulous space has all the teeth present posterior to it so automatically this will be class four so this is a single edentulous space present in the posterior region so this will be class two here you can see there are six edentulous spaces the most posterior one determines the classification teeth are present anterior and posterior to it it becomes class three the rest of the five edentulous spaces act as modification so class three modification five so this was about kennedy's classification and applegate's rule and facets additions there are few other classifications that need to be considered as well and we shall discuss them in a separate presentation i hope you have liked this presentation please do like share comment and subscribe to the channel thank you